Welcome to this uh, latest uh, episode or issue um, number of live, eight and a half. Um, I'm, my name is Suzanne Cotter. I'm director of Mudan Luxembourg, and I'm delighted to be here this evening um, speaking with Akram Zatari, who uh, is going to talk with us from his apartment and in particular his kitchen in Beirut. Um, I'd just like to uh, say a few words of introduction about Akram. Um, Akram is uh, an artist who I think many of those who are listening may already know through his work that's been presented in museums and galleries throughout the world and is also present in a number of very important museum collections, such as the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Tate Modern in London, and the Suralves Foundation in Porto. Um, Akram uh, was born in 1966 in Lebanon, and he earned a Bachelor of Architecture uh, in the late 80s from the American University of Beirut, and a Master of Arts in Media Studies from the New School in New York in 1995. Since that time, he's produced more than 50 films and videos, all that share an interest in writing history and which pursue a range of interconnected themes uh, from relating to excavation, political resistance, the lives of former militants, the legacy of an exhausted left, and the circulation of images in times of war. Um, he, Akram, has played a critical role in the formal intellectual and institutional infrastructure of Beirut's contemporary art scene. Uh, I myself had the pleasure of uh, first meeting Akram in 2005 and of working with him in an exhibition which we presented in Oxford in 2006 called Out of Beirut, which was a group exhibition presenting the work of um, Akram and of his, many of his contemporaries uh, from Beirut. As a co-founder of the Arab Image Foundation in 1997, uh, Akram has made invaluable and uncompromising contributions to the wider discourse on preservation, uh, in particular photography and archival practice. In 2011, he was the fourth laureate of the Yang Yung Prize. In 2004, he received the grand prize from uh, the Association Culturale de Video Brazil. Um, and his work has been presented uh, at the Venice Biennial, where Akram represented Lebanon in 2013 with his film Letter to a Refusing Pilot. His work was also included in Documenta 13, curated by Carol and Christophe Pakaviev in 2012. So Akram, hello. Uh, you're there in your hello. kitchen. Hi, welcome to my kitchen. So tell us, um, I mean, a very interesting um, way of thinking about how we might have this exchange, which was about cooking and drawing during confinement. I, I think I, I think it's because of, the, because of, of all the pictures that I put on Instagram, all of a sudden people associate, associate me with uh, cooking, which is great. Uh, your studio is also there in your apartment, right? Uh, I don't have a studio space, like a proper studio space. I mm -hmm. have a desk and a living room uh, and a reception space and I work everywhere. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, I'd like to come, we'll come to the cooking um, and the confinement, but I just um, maybe wanted to start off with a kind of statement um, and would love to hear your response to this. I mean, when I think of you and your work, I think of the photographer, the photographed and photography in general. Um, I mentioned earlier this um, subject of the archive, uh, which of course you've been actively involved in uh, creating or founding uh, one of the most important photographic archives, if not the most important photographic archive in the Middle East, which is the Arab Image Foundation. Um, but you also, um, in the past, at least, used to talk a lot about field work and the archive and the field work come together. Mm -hmm. um, I just sort of point out some examples for those who are listening, who perhaps are less familiar with your work. 
um, working with the studio Shahrazad of Hashem El Madani in, in the city of Saida, which is where you are from. Um, you have been working with that uh, the archive of that studio of the famous portrait photographer um, for many years now, but you have also created um, a, an important body of work around not only that archive, but around the studio uh, of, of the photographer. Um, the field work also comes in, uh, and perhaps here is where we move into the idea of excavation. Uh, you've made work about a house in Beirut and a buried letter in this house in 2005, um, but also about a school building in Southern Lebanon that was refused to be bombed by a pilot during the period of the civil wars. Um, and you talk about refusal as a constructive act. So I guess I wanted to ask you, um, whether your thinking about refusal has been further nuanced by the experience of confinement and the global pandemic. Oh, refusal and the pandemic. I, I don't know. I, um, refusal is something, uh, is, a, has a, is a double sword. I mean, it's great to be able to refuse an order. Uh, but it's great at the same time to be able to bear the responsibility of one's refusal. And I think this is by far, ethically, is by far much more important because you can, one can keep on refusing and refusing and refusing and running away from the circumstances <coughs> of, of one's refusal. Mm. So if refusal is a political uh, position, then great. But if refusal is just for the wish of refusing and which I would respect as well, because some people's being, entire being, is based on uh, on refusal. And there was once, a, a, we would call it in Lebanon, uh, the refusal front, who would say no to any proposition. And they are, this is the culture of, re, of refusal, which I wish, as I said, as I, I respect. But when it's about the political position, one needs to assume one's position, one if it's refusal, therefore bearing the consequences of um, refusal is very important. Well, refusal and, and confinement is, um, is intense because uh, it, under confinement, things come back to you, things from your past, uh, therefore the memory acts on your system in such a way that it brings back things feelings, um, the mere fact of being locked in one position uh, with the impossibility of, of circulation as one used to circulate in the past is uh, a violent change. It's like going, it's not like going to prison, it's similar to going to prison. And the fact that you are stuck in a, in a geography, not by choice, not, not by your personal choice. Mm -hmm. So this gives, um, makes your imagination sometimes go wild. Mm -hmm. So whether refusal comes, uh, imposes itself or something else like uh, seduction, like um, uh, uh, emotional um, state that you might be in that you, that makes you do things that you've never done before, like calling your friends more intensely, telling them things you never told them uh, before things like that, but I mean, I, I think confinement has to do with some kind of between brackets nesting. Uh, you kind you look inwards and you tend to produce in inwards. At least that's that's in my case. I mean, I, yeah. Um. If you were just, to, if, if it's possible to project your mind into the future, despite everything that you've just said, how might you um, think about the archeology span of now? I met, I'm just gonna qualify that question because um, I think we could think of your practice as an ongoing archeology span of the present. Um, and I know I mentioned earlier the work that you've done with archives, such as with the archives of El Madani and his studio, Sherazad, or the photographer, the Egyptian photographer Van Leeuw. Um, and it's through this ongoing um, excavation 
of the archive and representation that you, it's been recognized that you engage in a, in a sort of rewriting or in a writing of history through the subjective lens, both of the photographers concerned, but also of the photographed um, themselves. So it's a very, um, and we can talk a little bit more about other projects, you know, that you're working on. Yeah. But you know, have you had any thoughts um, as to how you might begin to imagine the archaeology of now, from your in terms of the way that you work? I mean, it's irritating to think of of, of the archaeology, um, the the archaeology in the future that is going to deal with the subject of today. Uh, it's scary because it's going to be so advanced. If it happens, it's going to be so advanced technologically. Mm -hmm. uh, and so open to data. So, I mean, imagine people who look from the future till today will be able to look at our Facebook accounts, look at, look at our Twitter accounts, look at our photographs and the comments that we get on our photographs on Facebook, Instagram, or any other, uh, they will be able to see what we bought. Uh, they, they will be able to have, um, uh, the log of our uh, the transcript of our credit card, see how what we bought for how much, etc. Where we traveled. So in a way, I'm jealous at them because I'm working on a period where it's really, really hard to get a piece of information about an individual, hmm. and that would be a king. Yeah. So um, so yeah, it's it's frustrating. I don't want to think about it. I, I want to resolve. Uh, the periods and the information I'm looking for uh, uh, in, a, in like 50 years ago or two centuries ago, because that's the, the earliest in the past that I'm, I have worked on is 500 BC. That's my current research about two Phoenician kings, a father and a son. And they are both in between 500 and 400 BC. And it's quite difficult to get access to information. Do you, do you want to say a little bit more about that? I mean, that these are, or maybe I can just sort of add to that as I understand it. The research revolves around two sarcophagi um, that were excavated in the south of Lebanon, but you know, a century or more ago. Um, and as you said, of two successive generations of rulers, of kings, Phoenician kings, and that one of the sarcophagi is now in the collection of the Louvre Museum in Paris, and the other is in, um, I'm not sure which museum, but in a museum in, in Germany. Um, no, it's in Istanbul. The second oh, one is Istanbul. The, yes, of course, in Istanbul. In Istanbul. Yeah. So I know you're sort of asking a number of questions around that, but could you say something about how you're beginning to approach that subject? Uh, from a position, first of all, uh, these are two artifacts that were found uh, uh, in my city, in Saida. So I reached them um, in the framework of an interest in the city's history from Hashim al Madani backwards. Uh, very specifically, uh, my interest, like, my curiosity actually led me to that because, okay, why one of them is at the Louvre and the second one is uh, in Istanbul? And that raised a curiosity. Therefore, uh, I started uh, searching and realizing actually that there's an Ottoman law that somewhere in between the two dates of these two excavations uh, did not allow anymore the sale of uh, archaeological artifacts or the export of ar archaeological ar artifacts outside the Ottoman Empire. Sidon and Lebanon were part of the Ottoman Empire until the French mandate in the 20s and until the fall of the empire. So that raises questions, uh, okay, uh, therefore if from a 19th century perspective the one of them only has been exported because the second one was taken from a province into the capital, simply because uh, Istanbul was the capital of, of, the, of the empire. 
So I'm interested in, because of the Arab Image Foundation, because of my long history in taking photographs, transporting photographs from a place to another, uh, generating copies of them and studying them, I often uh, compared the gestures, what, what you called fieldwork, I compared it with the fieldwork of archeologists. And therefore, I, I started getting interested in the artifact itself, not the data only that, that it carries. So I'm interested in a photograph because it's uh, an, an artifact, not because it shows me something specific, not because it's a description, but because it's an object that was born in a certain um, era and reached me at a certain time. Uh, similarly, a sarcophagus could be, um, the use of the sarcophagus is, um, is, is to put a corpse in it, to bury someone in a sarcophagus. But today we, we exhibit sarcophagus not because of that. We exhibit sarcophagus because there is a culture of making sarcophagi, uh, ornamenting them with sculptures. And in the absence of sculptures from that time, maybe, those artifacts are substitutes talking, they're, they're, they're talking about the culture of making sculptures, let's say. Mm. So I'm interested in all of this, in the displacement of objects from within a function to serve another function in another time. I'm also interested in the idea of provenance and what links does it uh, establish between the Louvre and Sidon and the Istanbul Museum and Sidon, given that it's, uh, showing in its gallery objects from that place. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested, yeah, in, in like in the theoretical framework that carries all of this, let's say. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a very big subject and I know that it's also part of your interest, um, the sort of broader uh, discussion and uh, in museums in general, and particularly in Europe around restitution. Um, and, and I think it's interesting at this moment that you're thinking about that. And if we take the term restitution, we think I think back on on your work, such as the work you've done with Al Madani, but for example, the project you did in Saida. Now, quite a number of years ago, um, it was during the 2000s, where you took um, you took portraits of shopkeepers and business owners insider and you replaced them in those, um, those shops. Sometimes it was with the succeeding generation of people from the same family who were running it, sometimes with different people. And I had the privilege of actually going on that visit. And it was a, it was a tour through the old city um, of cider, but it was also kind of a tour back in time. But there's something I think now, thinking about what you're working on now, is a, there's an act of restitution somehow in, in what you were doing there. And through that act, generating various um, levels of reflection and certainly different questions. But it's an interesting time to be thinking about the subject of restitution exactly at the same moment when monuments are being toppled uh, don't you think? If you think in many places, parts of the world, particularly in sort of the, let's call it former colonial um, world, certainly the Western world, but in North Africa and in Europe, statues are being taken down. And then the question is, what happens to them? You know what you think about that. In relation to, it's more the sort of conceptual relationship between taking down statues and then restitution, because what does... Yeah, I mean, taking down statues as um, as um, as an act of violence against uh, uh, political leaders or dictators. Are you talking about that, or are you talking more about uh, ISIS destroying um, uh, uh, sculptures in Palmyra in the Museum of Palmyra? I mean, these are two different things, and I don't. Very different to... and interesting. No more to do with, for example, in in England, there was a statue of. Oh, um, decolonizing. Yes, that's the, true. You yeah, know, associated with the colonial project and slave and the slave trade, of course. Yeah. And you have and so there's a I, there was a fantastically interesting article that just appeared in the last issue of Art Forum, written by Paul B. Preciado 
uh, precisely yes. about this question of the monuments. And at one point in the text, um, he proposes, well, find a place or a site somewhere in the world where all of these toppled monu uh, monuments can be placed and people can just walk through them. Um, so it's a, it's a different, it's a restitution of a different type because in a way I think what the toppling of the monuments there yeah, is. Let's, uh, uh, you, you're right in bringing this up because both of them try to unmake, to undo, to undo colonial gestures. Mm -hmm. But in reality, neither one would succeed. Mm. Um, you cannot undo rape. Mm. You cannot undo uh, uh, physical mutilation. Mm. Even if you say sorry, it's not undoing. Sorry mm. is accepting the past. Mm. So let's um, put the term undo uh, on the side. It helped me only explain uh, what, what, uh, what these phenomena are. But clearly, one of them is spectacular and the other one is less spectacular, like um, destroying uh, a, a monument that glorifies uh, a colonial period. Uh, whoever is doing it in England is doing it uh, some kind with a, I see these as like a little bit uh, like populist. Uh, people have the right to do them. They, are, they do not hurt. They do not hurt. They are only hurting a sculpture. They are not really undoing uh, violence. This is why I'm saying there are there are like populist uh, discourses or acts, but still people. I mean, they want to invite Euro News or BBC or whatever to to film it and therefore raise that discourse or the raise that position uh, and puts it forward. Mm -hmm. Restitution is less um, is less uh, of an event. Um, but its problem is that it claims that damage can be undone, mm. which is only partial. I think damage could, if, because damage is not only the possession of, um, it's not about theft. It's not like I stole from you 100 euros and I will give you back the 100 euros with interest. A court would have resolved it that way. But when, when you're only uh, uh, addressing um, only a part of the equation that is that, that has to do with creating museums and um, appropriating archaeology and moving it from colonized to colonizing capitals, you are only um, um, you're taking the easy way, and you are addressing only a part of the of the damage that was caused by by colonialism. And sometimes. Um, even if you send it back, the problems of dealing, it, dealing with it uh, at home, sometimes there are, uh, uh, of course, it's the problem of, of, of that country, but sometimes that issue is not really resolved. Yeah. I mean, in the sense that museums might not be prepared to have, some, to have something of that uh, scale, for example. This is why I think I would want to problematize restitution and complicate it so it's not, it's not the easy. Uh, yeah. Let's address all the issues of that, that are related to restitution and maybe restitution in the sense of moving this from Europe to Africa or Europe to the Middle East, maybe would not be the primary uh, thing to do. Maybe there are other smarter ways, not smarter, the idea is not to be smart, uh, maybe there are ways that have studied the complexity of the situation way uh, in an advanced way and uh, thought that it's healthier and more knowledge productive to resort to something else that is a big question mark and that that big question mark needs to be researched case by case, mm -hmm. problematized case by case. And therefore, the project Father and Son about these two sarcophagi that were um, uh, that each one took a different path and ended up in France and, and Turkey today. Maybe there is um, a more knowledge productive um, way that allows us today to serve better their provenance. Yeah. The culture I, of their provenance. Can you believe it? I mean, we only have five minutes left. 
Um, and we haven't talked about cooking and we haven't talked about drawing. That's <laughs> fine. That's totally fine. But um, just on that point, um, it's interesting. And also in another recent essay I read by Hal Foster, um, he sort of, you know, because many art historians, like everyone is trying to make sense of, of this very dynamic, current, uncertain moment. But he, in his essay, he refers to Baudelaire, Baudelaire writing in one of the salons in 1846. And Baudelaire using the term uh, mnemotechnie, which is, means a sort of transmission of memory. And I think your work and, you know, listening to you talking about this new project with the two sarcophagi, but all of your work with the archive and the field work is also, um, as you say, a kind of exercise in resurrecting certain memories, but as a result of that saying, what can we learn from this? What can be transmitted? Um, and working from in Lebanon and within the broader Arab speaking world, there's an important um, role that you're playing in, in giving expression, to, making visible, and also giving expression to cultural memory, but also perhaps asking some questions that aren't so easily answered, but that's also part of the richness of what you're doing, right? I'm a product of the place. It's not me that is acting like a memory. I don't see myself as the person who's keeping the memory of a place. I think mm -hmm. my interests, are actually the product of this place, uh, its problems. The, they are a mirror of its problems, its, um, its, its pitfalls, its lacking um, registers maybe. Um, yeah, and, and, and Baudelaire is, uh, is great. Imagine they made us, <laughs> I always say, like they made us read Baudelaire at 16. I mean, I want to read Baudelaire now. Thank you for bringing up this. I, I, think, it, I think I have to read it. Hmm. Yeah, you must. And well, though, just when we've got a few more minutes left, tell us then about drawing. What's going on with the drawing? drawing? I mean, I picked up drawing a few years ago, maybe in 2015, I started doing pencil drawing. I mean, of course I have a draw, drawing- uh, uh, Background. Experience, uh, education, with, it comes with architecture. You need to draw and you, yeah, I took a lot of painting classes, but uh, I kind of started to take this seriously in 2015 when I was working on photographs, on pornographic photographs that I did not want to repeat and I did not want to exhibit mm -hmm. because I don't want, I did not want to circulate for, um, pornography even as a, as a, a material of study. So I decided to draw them. Mm -hmm. line drawing and I enjoyed it so much I think uh, drawing is a great uh, meditation like swimming we've done swimming me and you and that thank you I, I cannot thank you enough for taking me swimming in New York so, <laughs> uh, they are actually meditative uh, and and now when the when the confinement started again in, in April I picked drawing again uh, I, I did small paintings uh, with acrylic and I love it. I love it. It's, it's exactly, it's the feeling of creating, feeling, feeling of cooking. Like when you cook something, you can't wait to taste it while it's cooking, but then later and next day you also try, try it because it changes um, taste. Um, when you wake up next day after doing a painting, you go... Uh, taking it and just looking at it afresh yeah. next days, like after closing you. And I love those videos. Video does it too. Yeah, video does it too. But it's different because video is already a time based. Um, and so you need to switch it and wait and it's an experience in time. But the food is, uh, the smell of it, the taste of it are immediate. And the look of, of at something still, at, the dates from yesterday evening is also something so, uh, so so much you look for it. Yeah. So, so when do you think we might see some of those drawings? I mean, I think you have been showing some. Uh, some of them already were advertised on the on the Mudam uh, uh, yeah. site. On the site. Th those I, I made in April. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting that um, 
and just from what you were saying at the beginning with you know this whole question of the archaeology of now you know where everything's via you know the passage of social me images via social media the connectivity of everything that you're actually really focusing in on these small intimate um, and things such as drawing, such as cooking, and also swimming. So you're fortunate that you can go to the ocean. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, we are solid. I mean, I'm uh, like we are solitary humans. Even if we were surrounded by people, uh, what it, what makes us um, who we are uh, are very very uh, specific traits that makes you an individual. An individual meaning like you are not like him. Him is not like her, her is not like her. So uh, what adds to the traits of us um, is, is, um, is what we like to do, what we like to do. Akram, our time is up. So um, it was we really, really can stay nice. on a little bit more, but I think we're going to be switched off. So I think just to say thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, and Taufik is going to switch us right now. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're still live. <laughs> well, we can keep That's talking great. until Tauf Taufik switches. Yeah, I mean, by, by the way, I did not mention that I'm, I'm, the project I'm doing now has become a, my PhD project. So I'm a PhD candidate. Mm. Uh, at the University of Sergi and at TU in Berlin. Sergi is in Paris and then TU is in Berlin. And this is where the confusion might have come, by the way, that the other sarcophagi is in Berlin. Uh,